Welcome back to the Charismatic Voice. Today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the legendary Pink Floyd for the first time. Many of you are probably very familiar with Pink Floyd, and I know that I've heard some songs on the radio, but I've never done a deep dive or analysis of the voice. I don't even know who's singing the lead vocal or vocals. And to be honest, when I was doing research, it was a bit confusing. It looks like they trade vocals off. I'm going to need your help. I can tell already. So the reason that I'm doing this video is because I heard Comfortably Numb for the first time a few months ago on a patron playlist. We were driving in the car. This song came up and my jaw just dropped. I thought, wow, that's really, really good, it was really touching, but it was on a car speaker, and I wanted to hear it in a much, much more friendly acoustic environment, and I really want to hear a live performance. So I've only heard it once. This is going to be my first time actually seeing it live, actually getting to hear it in good speakers, and we're going to be taking a look at the Pulse concert performance from 1994 in London. Let's get to it. This vocal styling and harmonization is very it's strange. It's interesting. It's intriguing. Draws you in right away. There's a lot of things that are unexpected happening in there. Uh, there's definitely some speak singing, essentially kind of talking, but kind of on pitch. Um, it's so interesting when you talk about like, what is the definition of speak singing? We're all kind of playing around with pitch when we're talking. And I would just say speak singing is where you're elongating the words more and not necessarily being 100% specific with the pitch, you're kind of 50% with pitch. So there's a loose definition for you. And in addition, there was a really weird, uh, it sounded like an up, word slider glissando at the beginning that was pretty awesome. But let's go back one more time, that was cool. But <laughs> an interesting intro because these guys some of them are singing or sing speaking more than others and there is a a hint at various harmonies in that harmonic structure often it feels somewhat stagnant there's a lot not a lot of movement and when it does move it seems to mostly be moving in a parallel fashion so uh, harmonies often will kind of come in and out and do this together in more modern music. But if we go back to like Gregorian chant, we see a lot more parallel movement in the harmonies where they kind of go up and down like this, which makes it sound archaic. Or in, in this, it almost feels like it's distorting our perception of time. There's something that feels, it feels archaic, yes, but it feels like it's just... Uh, I like the word psychedelic for it, and I like the word psychedelic to describe Pink Floyd so far as well. So I'm going to go with that, psychedelic. Let's get going. Relax, relax. 
I do like the way they're all coordinating their enunciation well together. It's like they've got like a little trio there. And I don't know who these guys are. I don't, again, I haven't seen their faces and, and put them together before. I know that, let's see, Sid Barrett, David Gilmore, and Roger Waters are all uh, singing, I believe, on this. Richard Wright, too, maybe. So maybe we have three of those guys there, but I, I don't know. You guys can help me out in comments and tell me exactly which face goes with which name. I would super love that. Let's keep going. There is no pain you are seen in. The days can shift smoke on the horizon. You are a I want to talk about his voice and also talk about the line he just said. Uh, I don't know who this is again. Maybe it's Roger Waters. He's the one that wrote the lyrics to the song. Might be somebody else though. His voice is so smooth. I was trying to think about like what it reminds me of. I would say it's like water droplets on silicone. It's just, it is like, it feels like it's just flowing very, very nicely. And he still enunciates well. You hear a really good breath support underneath there, but it's also um, has an, a particular style to it where he's falling off the ends of words, not really sliding off. It's like a very slight slide and lets it just almost hover. It's very interesting. And then this line that he just stopped on was one of the ones that I had read about in some background research. Um, is about the hands feeling like balloons. So it says, when I was a child, I had a fever. My hands felt just like two balloons. Apparently he wrote this song or Roger Rodgers wrote the lyrics to it in reference to an actual event from his childhood where he was really sick. And uh, he felt like reality just was distorted because of this huge fever. And so he wrote this entire song about that experience. But tons of people think that it is about drug usage. I think it's a sign of a good song when you can take something and apply it to lots of different paths in life, right? Uh, I don't think that he would say, no, a person can't interpret it like that. Instead, he probably made those lyrics, even though they seem very specific to this fever moment, you can see, oh, well, I could apply it to maybe not just being in a fever, but maybe being in a a different reality at that point. I think it's fascinating that they were able to take such a specific moment from childhood though and relate it to millions of adults. So anyhow, let's catch that moment again and listen to that stylization and his silicone smooth voice. I had a fever. My hands felt just like Now I've got that feeling once again I can't explain, you will not understand This is not how I am Just comment, I might have gotten all of these names wrong because I see a, a woman here that is singing the backup harmonies. Beautiful, really great combination of the voices there. I feel like they both have that smoothness and common. It works really, really, really well. Um, I don't know her name though, uh, but it's gorgeous. Okay. So 
so I have to tell you that the one time I heard it in the car, it was the way that comfortably numb, I remember the way that that was enunciated was, it felt like it just struck me, right? As an adult, there are so many things in life that you might feel like you've developed to become numb to. And I really related to the message in this way of thinking, wow, what, what do I not really sense or experience anymore? And I like the way he said it here. I really like it. This big extended eye, or it's medium extended. It's not like the most extended note ever. Uh, it makes it feel like that person is growing to me and that the sustained nature of it has a lot of energy in it, but then you get to comfortably numb and it just falls away, right? It isn't sustained it's not even super specific in the pitch in some moments. Right? Such good delivery. interesting how they changed the lighting there so when you had the backing vocal you had her lit up in the back and then it darkened when it was just a him on comfortably numb look at that one more time hmm. I really love the the big sweeping of feeling in the song as well it feels very melodic um, uh, it feels floaty. It's just got such a great overall feeling to it. And uh, the way that you have these long extended chords that are being held underneath, you always have essentially a support bed of sound that's going on. And it feels, again, very, very smooth. that's happening right now. Um, I love this moment where he, he goes over to a little uh, chime for the pinprick, maybe? I'm not sure what that sound was. Um, but really cool how he's uh, really multitasking, doing so many different things at the same time, yet really able to stay in sync with his group here on those vocals. And there was a really interesting moment where I think the lights also affected a much, uh, another additional set of backing vocals. Okay, I need to see it again, that's all. Why would you think about doing that when composing a piece? Like, okay, let's have this sort of Gregorian speak, sing, chant, but then we're gonna have a moment where we have like a, it almost sounded like a gospel choir insert. And then we're gonna keep going with that speak, sing, speak. We're gonna have a chime for a pen prick. And oh, on top of that, let's be really specific about our Ks and match them all together. It's, uh, it's a very, very interesting and unexpected combination of sounds. I 
This, to me, hearkens to minimalism. Minimalism is a movement of composition. Uh, I know John Cage had some, I believe. John Corleano has done some. Um, there's, yeah, there's a whole bunch of minimalistic movements um, where essentially you have uh, a pattern that's repeating over and over and it just very slightly shifts. And often those patterns can be arpeggiated. Um, I'm thinking about an opera, Akhenaten, that I did with LA Opera that was really cool, all this minimalistic style. It, and that particular style of music often feels like it's slowing time down because it tends to have slower chord changes. Instead of having the chords together, they've been broken up into arpeggios. It's very, uh, very strange as an audience member when you're in that setting because if you can't sort of slow down and seep into this time distortion, then you're probably not going to be on that entertainment ride for, in an enjoyable way. You'll probably feel like, oh, this just feels boring. But if you instead allow it to seep over you and allow yourself to move or think almost at a different speed, it's an amazing, amazing experience. So I feel like Pink Floyd is doing something really similar here. And these are descending arpeggios. And you hear them shifting every now and then, but they're not shifting by a really large amount. Let me go back and listen to that. You are It looks like we've got some more backing harmonies from the other ladies in that group now. And uh, I, again, I think that this bed of sound is beautiful and the way that it's very, very subtly shifting underneath, but you have this melody that is so keen and interesting. Um, it, the melody and the way that has a falling away, everything here seems to work with this idea of um, distortion somehow of reality of time it's a fascinating combo and i had no idea um the the depths that could be found and often it feels like these are simple things but the way that they've matched them it's created this brilliant depth and experience in a song that feels like somebody who just is having a almost hallucinogenic experience i totally get why people think that this would be about drugs, but it also makes sense that maybe this kid just has a 105 degree temperature. the circle of lights. Yes, there's an amazing solo that's also happening. The The lights are grabbing me. Um, the way that they have the uh, fog, floating fog smoke fall, floating through it, it's lighting up. Uh, also the gradients of color. At one point it looked like we had the channel colors up there. Um, I love the way it can tilt as well. It's such a fun stage design. Also, I would be so scared to be underneath it. I always have a fear of lights falling um, while on stage.
<laughs> she don't tell. It's uh, very interesting to still continue to think about how are they sustaining the sound? How are they sort of lifting us out of maybe a normal perception of time? How, how are they slowing down time? And I think it's still happening, even though we have a drummer that just came in with a lot more energy, right? Drumming often um, can really get our hearts beating faster, which might feel like time is speeding up or slowing down possible in either direction. Uh, and even though you have a guitar player who's, who's really just killing it in this solo, underneath you still have these pedal sounds, these sounds that are sustained the whole time. You still have these chords which are switching very, very, very slowly. And uh, the, like, the bass is not super active. Basically, the stuff underneath is fairly stagnant. And that creates this feeling of just floating along, having like really cool happenings, um, but it's ultimately, uh, it's just wafting. It's really cool, I love it. a huge disco ball. This, this stadium is so enormous. I did not get the sense of how big it was initially from the video and oh my goodness, this is such a huge place to play into. I'm really curious how many thousands of people are there. And what is this this big light in the middle, this globe? Is it is it a big disco ball? Um, very interesting to see how they're lighting it from different angles. You know, it looks like it's mostly below, and so that lower light would then ping off to go to some of the upper stuff. But if you wanted to ping off and get something down there, I guess it all depends on the angles as well on the wall. But it's, uh, it, it is very interesting to me that they've got specific light sources that are coming towards it from below and the sides. You, you guys know that to me, sometimes certain slides and when it's like between pitches, 
Um, if they're really leaning into it, it, it just has a visceral effect. It kind of makes me shiver. And this like kind of sound that keeps happening and there's two instruments that are doing it back and forth to each other is, uh, it's, it's, it's so disturbing. <laughs> It's like we're really, really off the train now. Whoa. Coming back? Okay, I have to tell you, I thought the vocal was gonna come back, but I love that it didn't. This makes so much more sense because the that instrumental experience for me it had so much drive, this consistent growing behind it. I didn't want to be soothed by a vocal at that point. It felt like the instrumental was taking me somewhere uh, deeper and disturbed and and the vocal was smooth. The vocal had that feeling of the more numbness to it. And, oh, I'm so fascinated. And I feel like it was the right decision to not have a vocal come back in at the end. I like this progression and uh, this feeling that we went somewhere else that was beyond the numbness, but we still maybe somehow had the, the numbness on the top layer, but went somewhere underneath it. Wow, what, what a cool direction and song. That was brilliant. I love this evolution of the song. I loved this intro and the way that they had the vocals harmonizing, but not quite, and speak singing in there, it was almost like you had tons of different voices going in your head, really took you into the, the trip already there. And uh, the feeling of the, it almost, you know, it could have been like a rise in temperature even at the end as the instrumental was just growing and growing in volume and then became disturbing with those slides and different ways of playing the instruments. It felt like not necessarily the pure way of playing, but felt distorted. And that was so troublesome. I can see why we wouldn't want that smooth voice afterwards, but wow, uh, his voice delivered a beautiful message in the middle of it that really gave you an idea to put this experience to. But I love that we can extrapolate that experience from his childhood and say, oh, as an adult, maybe I experienced this trip in, from X, Y, or Z, you know, name whatever it is. It was amazing. And it was brilliant to hear how they use those musical elements to convey this experience. Wow. Just wow. I did not get Pink Floyd before, but I feel like after just digging my teeth into one song, I'm blown away and uh, and definitely wanting to hear more. So please, please, down in the comments, suggest more songs for me to listen to. Um, it really, if you put your suggestions in the comments, that is the best place for us to see them or through Patreon. We do have a great group of patrons. They're the reason that I'm listening to the song today. And we do things like playlist, Beat Saber, or uh, patron suggestions for YouTube. So if you want to join that community, they are amazing, amazing people. You can also find me here and chat with me every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday at 8 a.m. Arizona time. That's when we have live premieres and a really fun chat during those premieres. Or you can find me at thecharismaticvoice.com if you want to take any lessons in, in voice or singing or just music in general. There are courses on that there. I hope to see you somewhere soon.